And thank you all for joining us this morning. We have, um, we are very fortunate to be able to learn more about the recent research in glaucoma. Uh, and I am delighted to introduce Dr. Arthur Schwartz. Um, according to Prevent Blindness America, our area leads the country in incidence of glaucoma. So this is a really important program area for the Prevention of Blindness Society of Metropolitan Washington. And we are so fortunate to be joined again today by uh, ophthalmologist, uh, Dr. Arthur Schwartz, as I said. He is both a local practitioner and I like to call him also a national treasure. We are so fortunate to have him in our area. He has been involved with important research uh, in glaucoma since early in his career. Uh, and has contributed so much. Um, Dr. Schwartz is a nationally recognized specialist in glaucoma and cataracts in Washington and Chevy Chase. And he has pioneered the use of laser technology in the treatment of glaucoma. In addition to his well-recognized clinical practice, Dr. Schwartz has lectured, written, and published extensively on glaucoma. He has served as a principal investigator for uh, the Normal Tension Glaucoma Study and for two NIH-sponsored collaborative studies, the Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study and the Ocular Hypertension Treatment Study. He directs the glaucoma service of the Georgetown Washington, Nash Washington Hospital Center uh, facility and shares his knowledge with ophthalmology residents. We are so fortunate again to have you this year um, to share uh, your knowledge with us, Dr. Schwartz. Thank you so much. And I'll turn the, the um, mic over to you. Thank you. <clears throat> I want to welcome everybody to today's lecture. Uh, I'm going to spend about 35 minutes, roughly, um, talking about what's going on with glaucoma. And then after that, we'll have a time to uh, ask questions. Are we good, Sean? Yes, sir, go right ahead. Okay. So uh, today my lecture is entitled Glaucoma Now and the Future. I will start out with some of the basics. It's been very interesting during my career how the definition of glaucoma has changed. When I started out uh, being trained and in practice, glaucoma was defined as a high intraocular pressure. If someone came into the office and had a pressure above 21, which used to be the so-called cutoff, they were told they had glaucoma. But what we learned is that you can have a high pressure and not have glaucoma, and you can have a low pressure and have glaucoma. So we had to change our definition. So the second definition during my career was a level of pressure causing damage. Now, uh, glaucoma is called an optic neuropathy. The definition of glaucoma is an optic neuropathy. What that means is there is damage to the optic nerve and intraocular pressure is a risk factor, but it's not in the definition. How common is glaucoma? You heard that it's a very common problem in the uh, metropolitan Washington DC area. Uh, nationally, about 2% of the population over 40 has glaucoma. There are some special risk category groups being African-American, you have a four times greater risk of having glaucoma. And as you get into your 70s and 80s, African-American males in their 80s have about an 8% chance of having glaucoma, which is a very high risk. Hispanics also have been found to have a much higher risk of glaucoma. And one half of the patients, unfortunately, with open angle glaucoma are unaware of their condition. The other type of glaucoma in the adult that is the most common is called narrow angle or angle closure glaucoma, and that accounts for about 10% of the cases. We used to screen for glaucoma by measuring the eye pressure. And if the pressure was higher than 21, as I mentioned, we, you would be referred for further evaluation. I'm gonna try to see if I can move the people off to the side. There we go. Um, 
And you, if your pressure was less than 21, you were told you're okay. Well, that was a mistake that we learned and the way we do screening now has greatly changed because of the further increase in our knowledge. Okay, I just stopped being able to move the slides. You want me to you want me to start sharing then? If I stop share and restart it, I don't know why I can't move it. I hmm. just changed the picture. I got rid of the side stuff. Okay. Yeah, try try unsharing and resharing. Okay, stop share. And then share. Okay, let's see. Okay, I, okay. We now know that if what 20 to 40 percent of patients at the time of diagnosis, when you're diagnosed with glaucoma, about you have a significant chance between 20 and 40 percent of having a pressure less than 21 millimeters of mercury, which previously thought was to be normal, and you would have mistakenly been told you did not have glaucoma. As you know, as I mentioned before, now we have to look at the optic nerve because that's now defined as an optic neuropathy, damage to the optic nerve, and also do a screening visual field besides measuring eye pressure, which if elevated is a risk factor. We don't disregard pressure, but it's not diagnostic. So what I mean that the higher the pressure, the more likely you could have glaucoma, the greater the risk, but it's not diagnostic of glaucoma. Now the pressures in different populations differ, especially in the Asian populations. In Japan, 4% of the patients had glaucoma, but 92% for this, 92 of the patients with glaucoma in Japan had a pressure of less than 21 millimeters of mercury. Korea also had the same kind of demographics with 94% of the patients with glaucoma having had a pressure less than 21. As I mentioned before, in the old days, less than 21, you didn't have glaucoma. Well, you can see 90% of the patients in Japan and Korea would have been missed if you just used that as your definition. Now you heard in the introduction from Karen, which was very gracious, that I was involved in the ocular hypertension treatment study. And this is a very common condition. It's a very important condition. And fortunately through that study, we've learned a lot. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about it because I think it's uh, something that's uh, important for you to know about. What is ocular hypertension? It's a fancy term for saying that you have a pressure up elevated above the so-called cutoff of 21 but you have a normal visual field. You have a normal optic nerve and a nerve fiber layer, which is a very sensitive way of looking for damage around the nerve. Your angles are open and you have no other causes of why your pressure may be elevated. Now this was a, is a very common condition. About four to 10% of the population over 40 will have a pressure of 21 millimeters of mercury. And uh, 25, 30 years ago, there was a lot of debate about what to do with these patients. And what we have learned is more than 10 times greater prevalence of ocular hypertension than have glaucoma. So what, I, what I'm saying in that word is that if people who have elevated pressure, many, many more will not have glaucoma than do have glaucoma. And the big question was, who should we treat? We have these people with elevated pressure. We know pressure is a risk factor, but do we need to treat all of them to prevent them from getting glaucoma or can we treat some? And the studies that were available then, some of the studies said you should treat all, some of the studies said you don't have to treat all, it wasn't clear. So that was the impetus for why the ocular hypertensive treatment study was funded by the NIH. It was a uh, multi-center study and we had three different study centers in Washington D's who were participating in the study. And as I mentioned, pe people who were eligible to be in the study at elevated pressures, normal visual fields, and healthy optic nerves. And what this study did was we would treat half of the patients who had elevated pressures, and we would not treat the other patients, trying to make a judgment whether treating the patients helped in preventing them from getting glaucoma. And then we watched them for about seven years. The untreated group was called the control arm. What were the results? We learned that the treatment was beneficial, but you had to treat 100 people to protect five people. That means that 95 people were being treated and didn't need to be treated. 
that we do not want to treat so many. So we tried to stratify or look for risk factors so we could treat the people who are at the highest risk and not have to treat everybody. And what did we learn? What were the risk factors for people who are more likely to develop glaucoma over the seven year follow-up in the ocular hypertensive treatment study? And these are some of the risk factors. One was the level of pressure. So pressure was important for every 10% for every increase in millimeter of mercury. So if your pressure started out at 23 or 24 or 25 or 26 in the study, every increased risk, each millimeter, it caused a 10% increased risk. What's your optic nerve look like? If you had a larger cup, that increased the risk. How old you were, uh, for every decade of age, it increased the risk by 22%. The biggest surprise was central corneal thickness. Now that's a measurement of how thick the cornea is. And when we started the study, believe it or not, this parameter to be studied was not in the study. It ended up that a couple of years into the study, people were getting more interested in the role of corneal thickness. And we added this as part of the uh, study protocol because uh, it's something that doesn't change that much with age. So it didn't matter if we added a couple of years later or not. And Dr. James Brandt, who's out in uh, California, was the one who played a role in getting this into the study. And lo and behold, how thick your cornea was or how thin your cornea was ended up being the biggest risk factor. And that's something you're born with. You can't control it. So having a thin cornea made you more likely to have glaucoma and having a thick cornea reduced the risk. And the last of the five factors was what your visual field score started. And there's a measurement on the field score. And if you had a certain level, it increased 27% uh, for every two tenths of a uh, change in the PSD. Now, believe it or not, we just, there was an OATS-1, which I just talked to you about. There was an OATS-2. What we did in OATS-2 was the patients who weren't treated, we then treated. And what we we're trying to find out, if you delayed in treatment, did that cause a big problem? And what we learned is it caused a, a little problem, but only for the people who were at high risk. And then we just finished up OATS-3, which is an amazing study in that there's never been a study with 20-year follow-up of the original patients. And we're able to get a fair number. Obviously, some people moved away and couldn't be found. Some people died. But we got about um, 60 to 70 percent of the patients were able to come back for the study and be tested. We found that of all the patients who were in the study group, almost half of them developed open angle glaucoma in one or both eyes. But when you look at the stratification, remember the high risk group and the low risk group because of the five factors I mentioned, the low risk group had a 31.7% chance of developing glaucoma, while the high-risk group had a 60% chance almost, almost twice as much. So uh, what we've learned a lot, you need to look at the risk factors and the patients who present with elevated pressures. And if they're the low-risk group, the thin, uh, thick corneas and all the other factors, age, level of pressure, et cetera, you may be able to watch them comfortably. But if they're the high-risk group, you're probably better off treating them. So talking about treatment, that's a challenge for everybody. Usually open angle glaucoma is in an older age group. Everyone's memory not, may not be as good as it was. Patients are often taking many other medicines and costs is becoming a bigger and bigger factor with some of these drugs costing two and $300 or $400 a bottle. So cost is a big factor. And some patients obviously are gonna have to make choices because of our healthcare system, such as food or rent versus buying eye drops. Besides costing money, medicines cause symptoms. Your eyes may get red or irritated, your iris color and one type of drug that we use, which is very popular, may become a little darker due to an increase in the melanosomes. That's mainly for people who have hazel eyes. If you have a blue eye or a brown eye, that's not a problem. Occasionally with beta blockers, you can get some breathing problems. And the other big thing is the patients do not see better or feel better. So you don't get feedback from medicines helping you feel better or see better. The purpose of the medicines are to lower the pressure and prevent you from getting damaged because at this point in time, the only thing we have to do to treat glaucoma is to lower the pressure. And then the other big problem we have besides the cost of the medicine and the side effects is something called compliance. How good are the patients in taking their eye drops every day at the right time and the right amount using the right technique? And are they coming back for their scheduled examinations? They've done some studies about in pharmacy benefits to see how many people 
uh, have refilled their prescriptions and it's a frightening amount. You know, they get a prescription for glaucoma drugs and they're supposed to refill it. And they find that a significant percentage of the people never refill it. And some percentage of the people get the prescription and never get it filled for the first time. So one of the things I've tried to tell my patients to do to help you remember is if you have a smartphone, you can set alerts on your phone to remind you to take your medicine. There are watches that will set alerts for you also, just to help you remind, you know, if you take a drop once a day, you can say every day at 10 p.m. get an alert that you need to take your medicine or nine o'clock in the morning. And you can send multiple alerts a day. So that's one way to try to help you keep up with your medications for any type of medicine you take. Now, this is a video and we'll see if we can show it. This is a patient, this is from Dr. Alan Robin. He gave me this video of the problems that patients can have with their underlying medical conditions. So this patient has a tremor and you can see he's having a very difficult time getting the drop in the eye. This is another patient. And that's why some patients run out of medicine before their prescription refill is due. It's always a problem. Okay. I feel like you got it in. So you can see how big a challenge it is for some people. They're trying to get some eyedroppers that rest on your forehead and then you squeeze the bottle and you have a steady point. I often tell people to try to rest on the bridge of your nose or lay lie down and put your one hand on the forehead to balance it and, and to stabilize it. So it's a problem to get it in the eye. So what's exciting and new in glaucoma? Well, uh, there's been some exciting drug developments and we haven't had a new class of drugs in glaucoma in almost 20 years now. It's called a rogue kinase inhibitor. And the class of the new one in that class is called Ropressa. And it works by improving the outflow of the fluid in the eye. And if you improve the drainage channel flow, that lowers the pressure. And it affects that by uh, affecting the trabecular meshwork, which is the area within the eye where the fluid drains through. And it improves the drainage and lowers the pressure. A second new drug is called Visulta. This is a drug that's added to latanoprost or Zalatan, which is probably the most commonly prescribed uh, drug in glaucoma. So they add a second drug to the one bottle called butanol mononitrate. And uh, it is a nitric oxide, it releases nitric oxide, which also has some effect on the structure of the trabecular meshwork and improves outflow. And comparing it to another drug, which is commonly used called timolol, it was about a one millimeter benefit. So it's not a home run in terms of pressure lowering, but every millimeter in glaucoma makes a difference. The third drug I'm gonna to talk to you about briefly today is Roclitan. As I mentioned, Visulta added something to Latanoprost. Well, Roclitan adds something to Latanoprost and that's the Ropressa that I mentioned to you first. So you get the two medicines in the one bottle with two different mechanisms of action. Uh, this one, Initially, we had a problem getting it covered by insurance because it's very, very expensive, but more and more companies now are covering it, and it is a choice. It has a significant increase in redness for a few days, and some patients uh, cannot tolerate it, but in those that can tolerate it, it can work very well and be uh, helpful in their management if their glaucoma is not doing well with the standard medicines. Now we're looking at other ways to deliver drugs to help with the issue of compliance and side effects. Um, so it's, you know, when the patient comes in to see me, you know, I forgot to put my drops in last night. Well, you know, as a doctor, I'm suspicious because they're the one time that they may be there on their best behavior, so we'll come in to see the doctor. So if they don't take it when they're supposed to the day before, it makes you wonder what they're doing every other day when they don't have a doctor's appointment. So, and it's, you know, you're on a lot of medicines. It's not unusual you can forget it once, but you, if you forgot it last night, it makes me think you may forget it more. As I mentioned, using drops is a challenge for all the reasons that are listed here and I covered. So now we're looking at alternative delivery systems. What I mean by that is other ways of getting drops into the eye, which seems to, would be very appealing. And there are now uh, some new technologies that are being developed and some of them are already uh, ready and available uh, to improve drug delivery to the eye. 
One possibility is a contact lens that would sit under the eyelid and release the medication over several months. Believe it or not, many years ago, we used to have such a drug, a little wafer, like a very, like a tiny piece of a contact lens that was embedded with pilocarpine. And you put this, little, the doctor would put the wafer on the eyeball under the lid, it would go up under the lid and it would release the medicine for a month. And then every month you had to change the, the, uh, the wafer. Uh, but it didn't have a big enough market because pilocarpine has some side effects and uh, so that it, uh, the, the company stopped making it. Now they're looking at injecting medicines with a slow release parameter over time. And there is a drug now available called Darista, which is a form of one of the prostaglandins, bimatoprost, which is injected into the eye with a needle into the cornea, into the anterior chamber. And it's a slow release over four to six months. Uh, there are some concerns about its effect on the inner layer of the cornea. Could it damage the, uh, the cells over time? Uh, but it has, it's starting to get more attention and we'll learn more about it with time. But it's a new delivery system and I'm sure there'll be other uh, drugs using similar or slightly modified uh, uh, delivery systems to help in this kind of long-term delivery without having to take a drop. Then they're looking at uh, implantable extended release devices using microparticles and nanoparticles. And as I mentioned, there'll be an intraocular delivery technology that will allow for a customizable, customizable sustained release of multiple classes of mugs, of, of medicines. They were also looking at putting in the tear ducts. We have tear duct plugs now that help people with dry eyes but they're thinking about putting in the tear duct plugs that would be embedded, medicine would be embedded within the plugs. And over time, the plug would slowly release the medication and then you'd come in and get your plug uh, removed and a new plug put in. They're looking at a spray device that a patient squeezes and gets in drugs into the eye. Actually, there is an artificial tear that has that now that I've tried. So that's another uh, possible delivery system that might be easier than putting a drop and you just spray it and you have a bigger, uh, area to shoot for. And hopefully it'd be a, a long lasting slow release uh, spray that would uh, reduce the need to spray it often. And then even more exciting and coming down the pike is looking at gene therapy for glaucoma. Glaucoma is a chronic disease for which, uh, I can't see the rest of my slide. We'd like to try to get uh, a therapy that would be lasting with minimal side effects. And a gene therapy approach is one that might uh, allow us to do that. And what they do in this kind of approach is they take a, mu a mutated gene, which we think is, you know, maybe there's a gene, there are genes we know that are associated with glaucoma. So we, we take this gene, which is mutated and we replace it or inactivate it with a new gene that's introduced and proved to, that could be proven to be an effective treatment option. The new gene also could be used as a drug delivery system. They use viral vectors, introduce it in the eye, and then hopefully uh, they could modify the abnormal gene or use it as a drug delivery system. So now you have glaucoma. What do you have to do as a patient to make sure you keep the vision? You know, you need to see your doctor periodically. And what the doctor should be doing during these follow-up visits, one, we always look at the pressure. We check, you know, whether you're having side effects with medications, et cetera. We monitor the visual field periodically. We look at the field of vision to see if the field of vision is being impacted because as there, if there's enough damage to the optic nerve, your field of vision will be damaged and you lose a lot of field of vision. It can impact on your functioning, making you more likely to fall, more likely to have auto accidents, et cetera. And also we look at the optic nerve. Now, the way we look at the optic nerve has changed and we have a wonderful improvement in technology. Uh, we have a couple. We have one which is the standard way, which is still very effective. We still do it is to take actual photographs of the optic nerves using a high resolution color camera. And it's been we've been doing this for forty or fifty years. I used to do it. We used to have uh, Kodachrome slides. We would have a file of that patient in a, a slide cabinet, and when the patient come in, we pull the slides and we look at them and compare the the new slides, but obviously that's very cumbersome. So now we have sophisticated imaging devices that don't involve uh, Kodak slides and they're called imaging devices. Uh, we've gone through three or four uh, 
iterations of these. The HRT was the first, the GDX, and the newest one, which I think is the uh, most exciting one, is called the OCT. The OCT is, stands for Optical Coherence Tomography, a fancy word. And what this technology does, the device takes a laser scan of the eye and can detect very small changes in the optic nerve and the retinal nerve fiber layer thickness. And over time, you take periodic scans and you see if, it's, if the parameters are changing, which would indicate that the uh, optic nerve and the nerve fiber layer is getting more damaged. The OCT didn't start its use in glaucoma. It started to be used in macular degeneration and it revolutionized the treatment and management of, of macular degeneration. And you know, in macular degeneration, which is uh, another very common cause of uh, visual loss in the uh, older population, there's a dry form and a wet form. Well, the wet form, there's now a treatment for it where you inject into the eye every month to six weeks uh, a medicine, uh, an anti-VEGF. It, it affects the uh, leaking of the blood vessels in the retina. And the OCT was used to document that and to follow that. And because of, it got popular there, then we started to use it to looking at glaucoma and we could use it there. And yes, it's been very helpful. It's a non-invasive imaging technique that uses uh, wavelengths to take cross-section pictures of the retina. Uh, I told you that's how it started. And we can actually see the distinctive layers within the retina and measure their thickness. And in glaucoma, these measurements help with the early diagnosis, with the early detection, diagnosis, and treatment for both retinal conditions, including macular degeneration, diabetic eye disease, and also, as I mentioned, they're playing a very important role in the diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma, because we can pick up earlier on a more sensitive level changes than we can with the naked eye or the photographs. So this is a picture of a scan uh, of an OCT of the optic nerve. This is what the doctor sees. So uh, this is the optic nerve. The light gray color is the cup and the dark gray color is the nerve tissue. And in glaucoma, this cup gets bigger over time in this patient, you can see he has a large cup. Normally the cup takes up about 40 to 50% of the nerve. In this patient, it takes up about 75% of the nerve. Now you can be worn with a large cup and not have glaucoma, or you can have a smaller cup and it gets bigger. So having a large cup makes people think maybe we better look for the patient who has glaucoma. But what you see here is that everything is green or white, which means the nerve fiber layer is normal in thickness or even slightly thicker than normal. Now here's the left eye and you can see, it's hard to see maybe, but the amount of gray tissue, the dark gray tissue is a little thinner. The nerve fiber layer here in the right eye was 121 and the left eye is 77. That's a very significant difference in thickness. So this patient has some thinning of the nerve fiber layer because of optic nerve damage. You can see here, this color is showing the area where it's thin. And this is a color representation of the thickness with numbers. Green and white is normal. Red is significantly abnormal. And these are the areas that are thin corresponding to that. And this is for, uh, this does quadrants. This does 30 degree clock hours. So you can see that the patient has asymmetric damage to the left optic nerve and nerve fiber layer. And then this is the visual field of the same patient and corresponding to that damage in the nerve, the patient has a piece of vision, uh, the nasal part of the field where it's dark, where they've lost that vision and don't see it. Now, these are the pictures I talked about, the optic nerve disc. So here we see the, the blood vessels, the arteries and the veins. This is a stretching in someone who's nearsighted. Uh, the dark gray is the normal tissue. The lighter white area here is the cup that I've talked to you about. But what we see here and here are little red blotches. These are abnormal uh, little blood vessels that are broken called splinter hemorrhages. This eye, we see a, a typical what's called a splinter hemorrhage. When you see that on the optic nerves, it means the patient's optic nerve is not happy with the pressure. So that's a, a red flag to say, well, maybe we need to lower the pressure further. So Karen talked a little bit about some of the collaborative glaucoma clinical trials that uh, have been going on over years. Uh, I've been fortunate enough to be involved in uh, three of them, the normal tension glaucoma trial. There was a glaucoma laser trial, advanced glaucoma intervention study we were in, ocular hypertensive treatment we were in. This is SIGITS where they looked at early surgery, 
newly diagnosed glaucoma. Some got treated with medicines, some got surgery. And the last one is a recent one called the LIGHT trial out of England. Very important study where they took a group of patients who were newly diagnosed with glaucoma and they, uh, half of them they treated with medicines and half of them they treated with laser trabeculoplasty, which is an outpatient topical drop, easy to do therapy to treat the drainage channel to lower the pressure instead of using medicines. And this study found that in the light trial, uh, the group that got the laser first uh, did better than the group that got the medicines first. The laser group had lower pressures and better results, uh, better preservation of visual field and optic nerve and less need for surgery. So for a lot of newly diagnosed patients, when we say you have a couple of choices and how you're gonna be treated if you're just diagnosed with glaucoma, we can put you on drops or you can have a laser uh, many doctors now are leaning toward recommending the laser more aggressively than we did in the past because of this very important light trial study. Another area uh, besides the gene therapy that's an important new frontier in glaucoma and in other areas of medicine are the uh, utilization of stem cells to try to treat and improve conditions. And stem cells are undifferentiated biological cells that can divide and differentiate into specialized cells. There are embryonic stem cells and adult stem cells. And the sources of adults, you know, embryonic is they take it from the uh, umbilical cord. Uh, the adult stem cells are, can be uh, harvested from the bone marrow, the lipid cells, and the blood. Adult stem cells are now being used in medical therapies. They're being used in bone marrow transplantation. And now we can grow them artificially in the laboratory, which is a huge improvement and very important as a source. And now research is going on to use stem cells to treat many different types of diseases. They're being tried in retinal diseases, such as retinitis pigmentosa and macular degeneration. They're being tried in glaucoma. Uh, injecting uh, stem cells into different parts of the eye and attempt to treat optic nerve damage. Another area that is getting a tremendous amount of attention is neuroprotection. And as I mentioned earlier, at this time, the only treatment we have for patients with glaucoma, if they have open angle glaucoma, is to lower the pressure. So we either do that with medicines, laser, or surgery. But there's a whole other avenue that's being very aggressively explored called the neuroprotection avenue. And what that means is we're using uh, therapies to try to see if we can prevent the retinal ganglion cell damage and death uh, independent of pressure lowering. So, you know, you have the pressure, some people, the pressure is not low enough or they still continue to, to have further progressive damage. We're trying to use neuroprotection uh, mechanisms to prevent them from getting damage or slow the rate of damage. They're using animals with glaucoma and we're raising the eye pressure with the, in their eyes artificially and seeing if different drugs can protect the optic nerve from getting damaged independent of uh, pressure lowering. There was a worldwide study uh, looking to see if one of these drugs could be helpful having a neuroprotective effect. It was called the Memantine trial. This is a drug that initially was used to treat Alzheimer's. And it seemed in the study in the Alzheimer's patient, it seemed to maybe have some benefit for patients with glaucoma. So they enrolled 2000 patients worldwide. Uh, and unfortunately after four years of follow-up and millions and millions of dollars, it was not found to prevent progressive damage any better than the control placebo. Other areas of uh, New developments in glaucoma are some new surgical technique called MIGS or minimally invasive glaucoma surgery. There are many new devices available and some are under clinical trial and some are also uh, already been approved. Uh, a trabectome device goes into the anterior chamber and kind of uh, mechanically destroys the trabecular meshwork, op opening up the meshwork. There are eye stents that can usually be placed at the time of cataract surgery. There's some debate it used to be one, now you need two. How much benefit you get from it versus the cataract surgery alone. There's a ways, you know, we talked about improving the outflow of the drainage channel. The other way we work medication-wise or surgical-wise 
is to reduce the amount of fluid that's made. If there's less fluid that's being made in the eye, there's less the drain has to deal with. So there are medicines that reduce the amount of fluid that's being made called carbonic anhydrase inhibitors, but there also are surgical techniques to actually treat the part of the eye that makes the fluid, destroying the ciliary body processes where the fluid is made. And you can do it with laser surgery, or you can do it with um, a freezing device on the outside of the eye. And you reduce the amount of aqueous fluid that's made and uh, you can actually ECP or endocyclophotocoagulation. They put a probe into the eye, they have a, a video camera connected to it and under direct visualization, they can actually see the ciliary processes where the fluid is made and destroy them. Uh, there are devices that they're putting into the suprachoroidal space to help the drainage, but because of corneal problems, they had to withdraw it after four or five years. Uh, other devices you may hear about, there's the, gel, uh, the Zen gel stent. Uh, it's a, a little soft tube that goes into the eye and it helps drain the fluid. So I've, I've given you a broad overview of uh, some of the definitions, some of the studies, some of the basic treatments, some of the new drugs, some of the new surgeries. Uh, what's the bottom line is the future is now. There's a lot of exciting developments taking place in the diagnosis and treatment of glaucoma. Uh, thank you. I'm going to stop the sharing now, and I think we'll get to the question point. All right. Thank you, Dr. Schwartz, so much for that presentation. Uh, so for those of you who want to ask your questions, you have a couple different ways you can do it. One is you can vocalize them um, by unmuting yourself. To unmute yourself, there is a button in the bottom left corner that looks kind of like a microphone. You can click that. You also can do press the Alt button plus the A button at the same time, and that will also unmute you. If you are on a phone, it's star six. And if you don't want to uh, talk, but you want to write your question in, you can do so in the chat box. Uh, so I see that Millie has her hand raised. Millie, um, you're on mute right now. Can you, if you unmute yourself, I'd be happy to have you go first. <laughs> All right, while we're waiting for her, uh, Mina, would you like to go? Um, yes, I have a quick question. How do you know you have high blood pressure in your eye? You mean high eye pressure? Yes. That's a good question. Uh, unfortunately, glaucoma is called the sneak thief of sight. So you're not going to know. Most likely you'll have very, you won't have any symptoms that alert you until it's too late. If you have symptoms that you can't see or you have severe headache and pain due to pressure, that usually is an advanced case. Occasionally with the narrow angle, you can have a sudden increase in pressure and you'll have symptoms, uh, but that's kind of rare. So the more common thing is it's asymptomatic. So the only way you really can find out if you have eye pressure is go and get your pressure measured. Um, when I have my eye test, um, I have RP and they never told me about how, how was my high pressure in my eye. I, next time I gonna ask, you can ask, yeah. And also, as I mentioned, pressure alone is in everything. You can have a normal pressure and have glaucoma, and you can have a high eye pressure and have glaucoma. So the doctor has to look at your optic nerve. And if the nerve looks suspicious, they need to do a field test. Or if your pressure is elevated, they ideally should do some imaging of the nerve, do a field test uh, and uh, so to get more information. So pressure alone doesn't tell you everything, but obviously if your pressure is elevated, you need to be studied. Or if you have a strong family history of glaucoma, you probably should get a baseline exam um, of the optic nerve and the visual field. And what I usually do when my patients have a family history and come in for a checkup, everything's normal, I give them copies of their optic nerve imaging. So they put it in their medical record or they put it on their computer. So for the rest of their life, they know what the nerve looks like because over time we're looking for change in the optic nerve. So knowing what your baseline nerve looks like is very critical. When you have RP, can you also develop a glaucoma? I didn't hear, what is RC, what do you? Uh, retinitis pigmentosa. RP, 
Yes, <laughs> having one condition doesn't preclude you from getting the other. That is exactly right. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Millie, go ahead. It looks like you're off mute. Yes, uh, Dr. Schwartz. I am a glaucoma patient for the last 24 years and um, I have lost a lot of sight on my right eye, but I still have functional vision on my left eye. And I have been working with the military um, glaucoma specialist, Bethesda, and uh, now under the Veterans Administration who has provided outstanding support services. And I just would like to know what would it be uh, a process for which I can volunteer for any of the future tests that there may be occurring in the area? Because at this point in time, um, I, I first of all, I never uh, knew that I would be able to be partake on a test. And at this stage of my life, I certainly would like to run the risk. I understand. So the studies that I mentioned have very strict eligibility criteria, as you heard. Mm -hmm. So that in order to be in a study, you have to be meet the eligibility criteria. So uh, probably your best resource would look at the NIH website and their studies and see if they have anything that mm -hmm. might fall into your category. You know, and then you would have to be screened if they thought you were potentially a candidate. The, the NIH, the studies, the Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study and the ocular hypertensive treatment were NIH sponsored. So uh, they had multiple centers around the country, but it was under their uh, financial support. And they're probably the best place to look for uh, studies with specific characteristics of patient disease. Okay, and I also would like to commend you and the society for providing so much information because after being a patient of glaucoma for 24 years, I have never heard such comprehensive review of the disease and the status of medications and procedures. So I truly appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. I'm happy to reassure you that I know that at Bethesda Naval, you're getting very good care. And at the VA, I know the people there who are working in glaucoma. So uh, you're, under, you're under good care. Thank you. All right. We have a phone number 202, last three digits 116. Yes. I, um, uh, my name is Evelyn. And I wanted to thank um, Sean, Karen, and Dr. Swartz, as well as Buddy Moore, for bringing us this very important information for our site and just for our health in general. Um, and I have my question is, um, how often, sh if, if glaucoma runs in your family, because my grandmother had the early stages before she passed, and then my mother had cataracts, and before she could get surgery, she also passed at a young age. So how often, if that runs in your family, should you have the glaucoma test? Well, you know, I, how old are you now, may I ask? <laughs> oh, yeah, 78. Okay, so the older you are, as you saw in the, in the risk factors, age is a factor, strong family history is a factor. So my advice would be anyone probably above 65 should get yearly eye exams. And that uh, patients who have with your family history of glaucoma, as I mentioned, you should get a baseline visual field, baseline imaging the optic nerves, and uh, obviously your pressure being measured. And then if all of that is normal, depending on how suspicious your nerve is, your field and your pressure to determine how often you get the testing. But as you get older, if you know, if your pressure is a borderline, your nerve is suspicious, I would say yearly would be a, a good uh, safe uh, Bet. Now, obviously, if you're at higher risk, if, they, if your pressures are, they're worried that your pressure may be elevated or you, the doctor will have to decide how often he thinks it's safe. But in general, routine preventive with family history in an older person above 65, I would say yearly. Oh, wow. Well, I, I, I usually get mine done uh, once every other year because I'm pretty in pretty good shape, evidently. Okay. Well, and, 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 that um, may be the case. And, and my doctor keeps a good check on me. And I, I'm good. very appreciative of that. Okay. Um, but I also like to ask, um, when your eyes are dilated, why do you see, it's like you can see a spot on the wall that's so small. And why is it that? Why is that? Well, sometimes with the dilation, if you have a cataract, it may open up your field of vision a little bit and you may uh, see a little better. Some patients with dilation get more blurred and have more glare. So often when our patients uh, have a dilated exam, 
we ask them, especially if it's sunny out, do you have sunglasses or take a little wrap around disposable sunglasses yeah. to give them because you can be more glary. But also dilate if you have right. floaters, which are little particles in the vitreous that float around. When you're dilated, it may be easier uh -huh. to see them. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, because it has you when you when you go out after you your have been dilated. Right. You, I was stepping real high, you know, so I didn't know what was going on. Right. Okay. But yeah, that, that right. and I'd like to ask you a question about cataracts, if you don't mind. Okay. Uh, what is what is the cause of cataracts and uh, should they be removed? Okay, well, um, cataracts are a normal part of aging. Everybody gets it. There are certain conditions that make it more likely and that you might get it earlier. N number one is diabetes. Uh, number two would be whether you needed to have steroids by mouth or by eye drop delivery. Uh, steroids uh, can make the cataracts grow more quickly. And also steroids can raise the eye pressure. So you have to be careful with steroids. Uh, when to have oh. yeah. So when you to have cataract surgery, you have to individualize. A lot of people have cataracts and don't need surgery. So my advice to patients when I see them and they have cataracts, and I say, "What should I do, doctor?" I look and see how I think how significant the cataract is. A cataract is a clouding of the lens in the eye, and then I ask them how mm -hmm. they're functioning. Are they able to drive comfortably? Can they read comfortably? Are they feel safe going up and down stairs? Are they need more light? Are the colors getting faded? So I try to get a functional assessment of how much the cataract is impacting on their function. If the patients are functioning fine and not having any problems, they don't need cataract surgery. But if they're having visual problems mm -hmm. with the cataracts, then I say you might want to have cataract surgery. But also the doctor has to make sure there's nothing else going on that's affecting their vision, such as macular degeneration or glaucoma, et cetera. All right. Thank, Thank you so much. Give, this is very informative. I want to give everyone a chance to ask their questions. Words. Uh, so next is Rex Latham, 2008. Rex, go ahead. Yes, doctor. You mentioned stem cell research. Right. Can, this, can that research possibly repair or otherwise help already damaged optic nerves? I have low vision from damaged optic nerves. Well, I think, um, I think down, we don't know about it being able to reverse it. Uh, it may be used to help stabilize it and prevent further loss. And they are looking to see if in some patients, they may be able to get regeneration. So I, it, it's not there yet, but I know in certain retinal conditions, they have had improvements with the stem cell injections in terms of um, certain types of macular degeneration and uh, some other retinal conditions. Um, so um, I think, I don't know if in my lifetime we'll see it, but I think down the road, we're gonna be using stem cells and they're gonna have an impact on uh, improving function besides preserving function. Uh, who should I ask my ophthalmologist to contact regarding that? What well, you have to be, at this point, you'd have to be in a study. You know, there are people who are uh, off label. I heard of some practitioners in Florida who are injecting stem cells, you know, and people were buying it. And the problem was that it got to the uh, community's attention because they were getting infections from the injections in the eye. So it's not something you just want to go to a fly-by-night stem cell. Per I think you'd want to go to an academic center that's doing research in that area and seeing, as I mentioned, the other patient, whether you fall into the categories of patients they think might be. It it's very early. So I think you, you may have trouble finding someone who's doing that. Uh, but no, no, I mean, I, I, my doctor's in touch with John Hopkins and others. Yeah. So I'd I, I like would to find John out. Hopkins good, John Hopkins would be a good resource to see if they're doing anything. That'll okay. be NIH. Thank you. Thank you. All right. We had a couple questions in the chat box. So one um, was, so pressure is not diagnostic, but treatment right now is geared completely to lowering pressure. Is this correct? And in our area, who is doing light laser treatment and consults? When you say light laser, uh, first of all, what you exactly said is true. Yeah. Uh, that's what I told you. I don't, what do you mean by light laser? I don't, I'm not familiar with a lot of different lasers that are being used for glaucoma, so. Bridget, would you like to elaborate? No. Because we're using laser to treat the drainage channel. And as I mentioned, selective laser trabeculoplasty, we're using laser to treat the ciliary body. Uh, most doctors, glaucoma specialists, have that as part of their treatment armamentarium. So. I'm sorry. Uh, 
um, I, I thought uh, in the presentation it said light and laser together. Just my mistake. Okay. No problem. Me, 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 me. All right. Uh, Maria Proshin, go ahead. Hi, thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Shorts, for your presentation. Um, I wanted to find out, I um, find out that uh, eye dry, uh, dry eye syndrome is very common also with glaucoma patients. Doesn't that treatment of reducing the flow of fluid affect that or increases the chances of having that condition? Well, uh, one of the challenges we have is that some of the medicines we use can affect the corneal surface and they can uh, aggravate patients who have dryness. So where some of the patients are very sensitive to the preservatives. So there are some glaucoma drugs that are preservative free now to try to reduce that problem. But one of the challenges with patients who have severe dry eyes and need glaucoma drops is it can uh, make the uh, dryness and the surface more irregular. So uh, either use preservative free drops or perhaps you might be a candidate to have the laser surgery to treat the drainage channel, which might be able to reduce your need for some of the medicines. And also you have to be aggressive with the dry eye treatment with the uh, preservative free tears and maybe punctal plugs. And there are a couple of medicines that are over uh, pre prescribed for patients with dry eyes that can help some of them. Restasis and uh, Zydra uh, are some of the dry eye specific therapies in addition to artificial tears. So yes, glaucoma treatment can contribute and aggravate dry eyes, but we, we know about it and we have ways to try to ameliorate that to a degree. Thank you. All right. And then we had a question. Um, so there's a couple community screening programs out there and someone asked about using a handheld tonometer. Is that a viable thing to do in community screening? Yes. A handheld tonometer is a good starting point. It's not the gold standard, but some of them are very accurate and been calibrated and compared to the in-office measurements. So I think, you know, as I mentioned before, it's a, it's a screening device, but pressure alone is not uh, adequate to just screen for glaucoma. In the old days, that's how we used to screen for glaucoma. We got in the community, we measure the pressure. Now you really have to look at the you can measure the pressure, but you have to look at the optic nerve. If there's any question, you have to do a, a field. Sometimes the screening is can't do it in the field, but at least they can get you referred. And you know, if the handheld shows a high pressure, it definitely should be referred. The problem, as I mentioned before, is you can have a normal pressure and have glaucoma. So it's not uh, foolproof in that regard. All right, thank you. Uh, Wilma, go ahead. <laughs> Wilma, we're having trouble hearing you. Oh, oh we lost her. Um, all right, uh, Mary Bushelow. Nope, all right. Can you hear me now or no? Yes. Wilma, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Once you've had a surgical trapezectomy, however you pronounce it, and you are stable, is there any other thing that can be done to prevent further optic nerve damage or is it assumed that there will not be further damage? It's a good question. So uh, it would depend on how, what your pressure level is after the surgery and what your pressure level was when you were getting damaged before the surgery. So the goal of glaucoma therapy is to achieve a level of pressure that prevents you from further loss. And that's a pressure level that's variable in different patients. Patients who have a lot of damage need to have a very low pressure. The studies have shown, ideally, you should be less than 15 every time you're measured. Uh, and the lower, the better. So if you have had a trabeculectomy and you have damage and your pressure is running 17, 18, 19, then I would say you should have medicines added to the trabeculectomy to try to further lower your pressure. So uh, having a trabeculectomy can be very helpful. In some patients, that's all you need. But if the pressures are not low number wise, or even if your pressure is 13 or 14 and you're losing more ground, then you need to try to further lower it. And I would probably try medicines before another surgery. Yeah, John. All right, uh, Jacqueline, go ahead. Good morning, Dr. Schwartz. This is Hi. Jacqueline Jordan. How are you? Nice to hear you. I don't see you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I have a question related to age. 
at the time when folks should be screened. And particularly because as an African-American, I was told years ago that I might have glaucoma and I was about 40 at that time <laughs> and it wasn't treated. And so because I'm at an at-risk group, I also think about my children and I'm wondering, is there an age where at-risk groups should be screened? It's a good question. You know, depending, you know, if you have a, a mother or a father or a brother or sister who have glaucoma, I'd say at any age you should be screened and get a baseline. And okay. as, you, as you get older, uh, you know, the risk does increase. So, you know, I think everyone with a strong family history and being African-American, because sometimes, uh, and, you know, usually glaucoma is an older age population, but I've mm -hmm. seen glaucoma in the 30s and 40s in patients who are African-American, you can have glaucoma as a teenager. Uh, I've had, I have multiple patients who were diagnosed in their teens. Um, and then there's a form of glaucoma called uh, congenital glaucoma, where you can be born with it or develop it in the first few years. So in terms of your question, you know, with a strong family history, uh, I think anyone, 25, 30, 40, at one point, I'd get a baseline. And then okay. if everything looks good, uh, you know, you get your routine checkups. But as I mentioned, I give my patients a copy of their optic nerves because that's what we're gonna be looking at during their lifetime as they get older. So it's good to know what they started with. Thank you so much. And thank you so much for offering this presentation. My presentation, <laughs> nice to hear you again, Jacqueline. Yeah, Sean. All right, buddy, one second. Uh, Joan, <laughs> Joan's next. And Joan, you are on mute right now, but I see your hand raised. All right, I have two brief questions. I'm new to the area, so I'm still sorting out who to see. I'm a glaucoma suspect, and I, we have macular degeneration and degeneration in the family. Mm. So what I want to know is, would I go to see someone like you as a specialist for glaucoma, and you would also uh, treat the um, macular degeneration, or do I need to see someone separate for each? Well, it would depend. You know, you could go, you could start out with one or the other. Uh, you could start out, uh, you know, which is the higher risk. I think if you're a glaucoma suspect, I'd probably start out with the glaucoma doctor. And some of the tests that hopefully he would do if he did the OCT, it also would pick up macular degeneration, and you could see changes there. And then he could refer you, or you could, you know, start out with the glaucoma doctor. And then if you want to get baseline retinal exam with a retinal specialist, you could do that also. But I'd probably start with glaucoma first would be my advice. Okay. The other question is, I've also been recently diagnosed with uh, Parkinson's disease. Are there, are there things that I should look out for? Well, Parkinson's disease can affect the eyes. It mm -hmm. can affect the blink rate. It can make the eyes more dry. Uh, as you get older, sometimes it can affect tracking. But uh, I think, uh, you know, the, the dryness would probably be the most common uh, early on with Parkinson's. Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Mm -hmm. All right, buddy, go ahead. <laughs> All right, thanks, Sean. Uh, yes, Dr. Schwartz, thank you for your presentation. Very powerful. So thanks mm -hmm. a lot for that. I, I have glaucoma, and I, I'm being treated with two types of eye drops. One I think is lantroprost. The other is dorsal, dorsal solomide. Right. And um, what I'm finding though, is that I'm requiring more light than ever in order to see basic types of things. Um, so any suggestions in reference to how I should operate here, I find that things that I could see in the past I can no longer see unless I have light directly on it or I have a lot of light around me. So what a there are, two, there are two reasons that can cause that to happen. One is you have cataracts that are getting more developed. So I don't know if you have cataracts or not. They've been removed. Okay. And two of you had the capsulotomy. After the cataract, you can get a clouded capsule, which sometimes can affect your vision. The other thing is, is your glaucoma getting worse, which is why you're having more trouble and needing more light. Right. And the other thing is the drops irritating your cornea. And if your cornea is irritated, it's like looking through a dirty window and that can affect your clarity. <laughs> More light gives you better contrast. And people, you know, some people don't need reading glasses in the morning when they have a, a sunlight and they, and then as the day goes along, they need to put their glasses on because they need more contrast because the light's not as bright. Okay. So needing more light is a symptom that can be caused by multiple different things. Okay. And I would check with your doctor and see if he has any insight as to why it's happening in you. Okay, great. Thanks. Mm -hmm. 
All right, we had a question, just a couple more questions. So we have one in the chat box. Is there any hope for end-stage glaucoma patient to have uh, his vision improved by a stem stem cell treatment or any other treatment? There's hope, but unfortunately it's not there yet. So I think, you know, in the next years, but it won't be, I don't think it'll be immediate. They're working on it, but nothing so far, I think is available for regular patients uh -huh. um, for treatment yet. So I would make sure that, you know, you do everything you can to help with the POB and everybody in terms of functional help around the house, your daily activities and keeping your pressure as low as possible and make sure nothing else is going on in the eyes in terms of cataracts, cornea or macular degeneration that's impacting on your functioning. All right. Luis, I see your hand raised. You are on mute. Go ahead. <clears throat> yes. Uh, good morning. Thank you, Dr. Swiss, for your presentation. Uh, my name is Louise. I have glaucoma. And my pressure's been running from 16 to 19, and I do have dry eyes. But my question is, I, I know we cannot compare other people, but my, uh, I'm uh, one of seven children. And one sister, her pressure's like from 6 to 11. Is that too low, or is that the normal range? Could be. She ever had surgery or is she on medicines? Uh, yes, she is on medicine. Okay. As a matter of fact, she just had a, a um, transplant. I think it was a cornea. Cornea transplant. So, yes. um, you know, as I mentioned, about 95%, uh, maybe I haven't, I told you uh, 21 was the cutoff. So, statistically, 95% of the population's pressure will fall between 10 and 21. So, if your pressure is less than 10, some people's pressures are less than 10, eight, seven. If the pressure gets too low, if it gets down to one, two, three, zero, in some people that can affect the vision negatively. So sometimes too low a pressure is not good. But if your sister has pressures of eight, nine, and 10, and she's on drops and she has glaucoma and she has a corneal transplant, you know, I think she's doing all right. I don't see that as a problem. Pressure can vary and different, you know, usually it's hard with medicines and patients with glaucoma to get into single digits. However, if they've had surgery, sometimes they can get into single digits. And as I mentioned before, in the ocular hypertensive treatment, I talked to you about corneal thickness. So if someone's cornea is very thin, you know, the average corneal thickness is 540 microns. Well, there are patients who have 450 microns. Well, because of that thin cornea, the machine that measures the pressure, it's probably three or four points lower than it really is in the eye. So if someone has a corneal thickness of 450 and they measure an eight, the pressure may be 12. So that's why in patients who have glaucoma, we have to compensate and know what their corneal thickness is and then make adjustments on how well we think their pressure is doing. All right, thank you. You're welcome. All right, last question. It looks like Mary, you were able to get yourself off mute. Mary, go ahead. Oh, nope, I guess not. Okay. Well, I don't see any other questions right now. So I'm going to go ahead and call it a time. We are a little past 11 now. Uh, Sean, so can I ask one more? This is Bridget. All right, go ahead, Bridget. Last question. I'm sorry. I'm, I'm curious with the corneal thickness, how is that tested? There's a machine called pachymeter, a pachymeter, and it's very simple. It actually uh, touches the cornea with with, after it's sensitized, and it takes a, a, thick, a measurement of how thick the cornea is. It's very simple. The device, um, you know, is not, it's about $10,000 for the doctor to buy it or a little more, but it's a simple device. And um, more and more people, especially those who specialize in glaucoma, have it as, uh, available as part of their practice. So typically at a neuro ophthalmology office, you would see that? I don't maybe? know if they would have it. It depends. They may have it. They may not have it if they're doing neuro ops. I can't tell you. It's possible. Okay, thank you, sir. Right on. All right. Thank you so much, everyone, for joining us today. And Dr. Schwartz, thank you so much again for presenting all this information and sharing and taking time to answer all these questions. Where can people... Um, find your practice. Um, I know there's other doctors at your practice too, if yeah. you're not seeing patients. The Washington Eye Physicians is in Chevy Chase on Wisconsin Avenue. 301-654-5114. Uh, we have 
or glaucoma specialists. I'm, I'm kind of limited in new patients, but the other doctors are able to take them. They're all glaucoma subspecialty trained and they're very, very competent, but there are also a lot of other very good glaucoma specialists in the community. We're very fortunate in that regard. When I came to Washington many years ago, I was the first and only glaucoma subspecialty trained person. Now there are probably uh, eight or 10 within five blocks of my office. <laughs> so it's, it's changed dramatically. Unfortunately, we have a very strong in the community. There are a lot of very capable glaucoma doctors also. All right. Thank you so much again.